you, Rhonda. Would you take your Bibles with me this morning and turn in them to Psalm 118. So usually I speak to, at the beginning, those who are visiting with us and explaining where we're at in Genesis. Now I'm explaining to the people who are always here why we're not in Genesis. So as we begin the Holy Week and beginning with Palm Sunday, we find ourselves in Psalm 118 and we'll take uh, a two-week hiatus from Genesis and uh, get back to Genesis in just a bit. But maybe even a bigger question in recognizing that it's Palm Sunday is asking the question, why the palms are in the fridge downstairs, I just remembered I forgot to hang them. <laughs> Where's Cindy Scott? <laughs> She's just ready to kill me. Oh, boy. All right, well, it's not as decorative as it could. It could be. Picture palms just everywhere, just beautifully strewn, strewn about. Two of them covering my face right now. So, Palm Sunday, talking about Jesus' triumphal entry, and we find ourselves in Psalm 118. If you're familiar with the Bible, you might expect to find us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John that record the triumphal entry. So why are we in Psalm 118? Well, if you're an astute listener, you might have picked up from the very first scripture reading this morning that Daniel read for us from John's Gospel. Blessed blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, even the King of Israel. And then when you heard Pastor Alex read Psalm 118, you might have heard something similar because it's in actuality that Psalm 118 at the triumphal entry is quoted in part verbatim from Psalm 118. So I want you to just picture what's happening here. Jesus is marching into, riding into Jerusalem, working his way to the temple, and the people of Israel, upwards of thousands, I mean lots and lots of people, are receiving Jesus and they're crying out out from Psalm 118. And what I want to do this morning is explain why they did that. It's all I want to do this morning and then make some application. Why is it that Israel chose this psalm to scream at the top of their lungs as Jesus is marching into Jerusalem? Let's consider that this morning. They cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel, comes from, except for the last portion there, it all comes from Psalm 118, and the last portion is an interpretation of Psalm 118, even the King of Israel. So let's get to the bottom of it. This is a particular text that I would like, as much as possible, everybody's Bibles or phones open to Psalm 118, because we're going to be venturing through this psalm and dissecting it this morning. So please turn there if you haven't. What I want to tell you at the outset is Psalm 118 is found in a group of psalms Psalm 113 to 118 that's known as the Hillel Psalms. Hillel in Hebrew means praise. So these are the Psalms of praise. They have a definitive tone of praise to them. Worship to them. That's the idea in these Psalms. And what's specific to note is that it was during the time of Passover where Israel and, and, and the, the proselytes of Israel 
would celebrate these particular psalms. So they would read these psalms. They would sing these psalms. These were likely the psalms that Jesus and his disciples sang at the Last Supper before he marched off to the Garden of Gethsemane and went to the cross and, and to prepare for the cross. These were the psalms that all Israel were focusing on during this time of the year, the week of Passover. It's amazing, we'll get to this on Good Friday, it's amazing that God chose to have His Son sacrificed during the time that the Passover lambs were being offered up themselves. The Passover lamb, which Paul calls Jesus, He's our Passover lamb, was Himself being offered up. We'll get to that Good Friday, but what I want you to catch is that these Psalms, 113, 114, 15, 16, 17, and 18, are the Hallel Psalms, the Psalms of praise. But I want you to catch something a little bit deeper in these Psalms of praise. That these Psalms have to do with God being a global God. So these psalms were not just known as the Hallel Psalms, they were known as the Egyptian Hallel Psalms because they celebrate God's liberation of Israel from Egypt. That's the idea. So I want you to think, I want you to put yourself in an Israeli mind right now, and I want you to think, Israel at the time of Passover was thinking about when God liberated them, their ancestors, in a global way from the foreign powers that be at the time. So when Israel celebrated Passover, they were waiting for God to do that what? Again. Why? Because Israel at this point in time is in subjection to Rome. In other words, they're not the royal power at the time. They're simply under subjection of the world power at the time, namely Rome. Now, Rome's keeping them happy, but Israel wants to be liberated from Rome. They want a revolutionary. They want a Messiah to liberate them from Rome. So even if Jesus weren't on the scene, and all Passovers before Jesus was on the scene, they were singing these psalms, and these psalms were psalms of liberation. They're looking for another time where God would liberate them. That's what's happening. But now Jesus is on the scene. And so liberation is in the air. Because this Jesus is doing some pretty incredible things. And Israel is beginning to think the time has arrived. Liberation is just around the bend. Now, that's the context. Now I want to get to Psalm 118. And I want to point out the significance of this psalm so that when they quote this and chant this and scream this and sing it when Jesus is marching into Jerusalem, I want you to really feel the fire in their bones as they're singing this psalm. So let's walk through the psalm. Take a look at the psalm. I want you to notice right from the outset that this is a psalm of praise in the form of thanksgiving. It's a psalm of thanksgiving. How do I know that? Don't take my word for it. Look at the scripture itself and notice how the psalm is bookended by the very same line in scripture, which is actually the line that we have essentially tattooed there on the back wall of our church. It's such a poignant uh, line in the psalms. Look at how it begins. O give thanks, verse 1, O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. And then look on the very end of the psalm and see how it bookends with the very same line. O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. So this is a psalm of thanksgiving. But what I want you to notice even more so is that it is a psalm of thanksgiving Not just for Israel, but for the nations. It's very important to catch. I want you to look at uh, Psalm 118, verse 2. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Verse 3. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. 
Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. What what the psalmist is saying here is he's talking to three different groups of people that are all in one group. Okay? Here's the groups. The first is the, the, the general population of Israel. These are Hebrews. These are people with Israeli blood. Natural born. Hebrews. Natural born Israelis. That's the first group. The second group is the leadership of Israel, namely the priestly leadership, the, the Aaron group, the, the, the pastors and, and this sort of the, the leaders, the spiritual leaders of Israel. He's saying, now we just did general population, now I want leaders. You say his steadfast love endures forever. They scream, his steadfast love endures forever. Now we've got a third group. But who is this mysterious third group in verse 4? This is what I love. And I love this very much because this is us. This is our part. Let those who fear the Lord. In other words, you're not natural born Israelis. You're not natural born Hebrew. You are the ones that marched up with Israel out of the Exodus who were Egyptian. Now, this is probably not Egyptians themselves here. This is probably a later later date. But these are proselytes. These are people that joined and said, like Rahab, like Jethro, and like the Queen of Sheba, that weren't natural born, said, your God is the real God. And I want to be with you in this. And so they joined Israel. And so what I want you to catch is I want you to catch, this is an Israeli psalm, but it's also a global psalm psalm in that the gentiles were included in this psalm they had a part you and i by god's grace had a part why because god is a lover of all people every ethnicity that's why revelation will celebrate that around the throne there will be every tribe nation tongue if it could have said it other ways it would have because it wants to stress that every skin tone, every color will be gathered around the throne of Jesus Christ. Because God is not a national God. God is a global God. Amen? So, this is the psalm. Now, the next thing I want to get to is who? Who is the person, who is the person coming into Jerusalem, because that's what's pictured here, there is this individual that's entering Jerusalem. He's entering Israel. And as he's entering Israel, he's calling out, you say his love endures forever. You say his love endures forever. And you say his love endures forever. And he's marching into Israel. Who is this mysterious man? Well, In the psalm, this mysterious man is likely either a military general that just got done with a huge onslaught of wars. You know that kings in this day would go out and they'd fight, and they'd fight battle after battle after battle, and then they'd come home. And as they'd come home, they'd either come home losers or winners. And if they came home losers, you'd see other people with them likely, or you'd just see the other people because your people are dead. But if they came home winners there would be an incredible victory as the military general marched home with, with splendor, with, with, with winning. So it's either a military general or, and this is I think more likely, it is a king who is both king and military general essentially. He's like the leader of the general himself. He's the, the master general, the the president, the, 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 the guy that is in charge. I think it's him that's marching home. And this is picked up in John's Gospel when they're talking about Jesus, quoting this psalm. And they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So they understood whoever's this guy marching into the city to be the king. Now, what's the king doing? Well, the king is marching in to the city And he's recounting to the people. He's recounting to the citizens 
the victory that the Lord achieved when he was out on the battlefield. So I want you to picture this guy burnt up by the sun. I want you to picture if he had dark hair that it's blonding, his, his dark beard is blonding in the sun. He's been fighting. I want you to picture uh, cuts and blood and dirt and grime. This is a guy coming in from the battlefield, but it's been a battlefield of victory. And everyone is anxious. You know, we go to Galena and you see houses there with these, I forget what they're exactly called, but they were the place where the widows w- would potentially gather and they were this high, p- high spot on the house that had windows in it. And they would climb to the top to see if as the boats were coming in and as the troops were returning, their husbands were there. This is the, this is the climate. People are saying, is my husband coming home or did he die on the battlefield? How did it go? What's our future? And this general, this king, is coming back to tell them how God won the battles. And just how bad the battles looked at first, and in spite of how bad they looked, God had the victory. Look at the verses here, starting in verse 5. He's recounting what happened. He says, out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me, and he set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better. See, he's encouraging the people with what he just experienced. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. In other words, I'm not a king who makes alliances with other nations. God wins our battles, Israel. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. In other words, other alliances. Listen, now he's telling you how the battle went. He's like Israel. Verse verse 10. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me. Surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. I just am sad to even communicate this to you, but maybe some of you have seen in the news, it's kind of a side story, it took place in Arizona just in the last couple weeks, a man went to his backyard to remove a beehive from his backyard uh, couch. It was kind of an outdoor couch sort of thing. He goes back there to remove the hive of bees. They completely swarmed him. He made it to the front yard, Emergency was called, and when they got there, he's covered in bees, and he didn't make it. This is unfamiliar to us. We're we're not familiar with this sort of thing. We're not accustomed to this type of thing. They were more familiar with it. They're more outdoorsy people. They they were involved in this sort of stuff. This wouldn't have been a far-off thought from them. It would have been in in their purview of what they can understand, And the king is trying to say, this is how bad it was. Some of you know how bad this was. These nations surrounded us like bees. They were swarming us. It was just incredible. Just, we couldn't get out of it. That's that's how thick the battle was. And yet, look at what he contrasts it with, with. They went out like fire among thorns. So what he's trying to say is, thorns are, are dry wood. It's what he's picturing here. And when you burn dry wood, we're more familiar with if he would have said, like your your Christmas tree after Christmas. Some of us are familiar with that. When you light that thing, if you light it, it just goes up in a puff of smoke. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, at the moment, it looked like insurmountable. They're, They're swarming us like bees. And yet, when God got involved, gone. Just gone. So he's telling them of the victory. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. Verse 13, I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord, verse 14, is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord. What's the right hand? The right hand is the prevalent hand in most people, which means that it's the strong arm. And he's saying we had the Lord's strong arm as it were. And it does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. 
I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me. In other words, he trained me through this experience, but he has not given me over to death. So now I want you to catch this. This is so important as we get to the triumphal entry. Where's he headed in verse 19? The king has come back to Jerusalem. He's come back to tell the people of Israel Israel of God's victory out on the battlefield. And the place that he's headed, where are their gates of righteousness? The gates of righteousness are the temple itself. He's going to the house of the Lord. Why is he going to the house of the Lord? Because he wants to offer to God a sacrifice of what? Thanksgiving. God won. God won the battle. So he's marching in. Everybody's roaring. This is this awesome victory of the Lord. And he's going straight to the temple where he can give thanks to the person that he stressed throughout the whole psalm. Not himself, but God as the victor. So he's walking in. He's saying, open up the doors. Let me into the temple so that I can offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. That's the point. Look at Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. In other words, he's saying, look, out on the battlefield, all the other nations treated us like a disposable stone. This is a worthless stone. This stone is not part of our empire. We're going to what? Cast it aside. As I have shared with you about working in my attic, I'm tearing up the floorboards, but I'm keeping a lot of the floorboards to, to use in shelving for the attic and stuff like that. And so as we tear up the floorboards, I'll say to David or to Bruce, hey, we're going to keep this one because it's, it's usable. It's reusable. But this one, eh, just toss it. Throw it in the, in the junk bin. That's, that's worthless. I don't want that one. That's how the, all the nations of the world viewed Israel. Worthless. Exterminate them. Get them out of the way. Let's move on. They're not fit for helping us. Cast them aside. And the, the king is saying, ah, not only are we not just a stone that's w- worth putting in the building, God has made us a stone that starts the building. Cornerstone is the first stone laid. And what that stone does is it sets the trajectory for how that building goes up. It's the meeting point between the two beginning walls. And it tells you how the building's going to face, which direction it's going to look, what it's going to look like, how, how high even the cornerstone had to do with, as well as this way and this way. So the cornerstone is the most important stone, and he's saying, that's what God has made us. This is the idea. And then it's at this point, as he recounts this victory, that the people of Israel respond. Up to this point, it's the king been telling them about God's victory. Now the people respond back to him, and look at what they say. Look at the, the plural as the plural start here. 23. This is the Lord's doing, they said. It is marvelous in our eyes. Notice it's not singular anymore, it's plural. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who's the he they're talking about? They're talking about the king. They're saying, blessed is him who just had victory in the Lord. Blessed is him, is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. What are they saying there? He's made his light to shine upon us. Well, for those of you who are familiar with the Old Testament, you'll remember that God told Moses to tell Aaron to bless the people of Israel. And here's how that blessing was supposed to go. Number six over here. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you 
and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So the idea here is God's face was understood to be illuminated, light. That's why it would shine on them. And what they're saying to the king here is they're saying, in the victory that he gave you, number six, the the, the blessing that's been pronounced upon us is actually being fulfilled. It's happening. God's face has shone upon us in the victory that you're retelling. Therefore, at the end of verse 27, bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. In other words, let's continue in the sacrifice of thanksgiving, king, that you want to offer. Let us not get in your way. You go to the temple. You offer up that sacrifice, and we're going to do it with you. This is the idea And so now the psalm closes by going back to the king. Look at verse 28 and 29. It goes back to singular, and the king says, you are my God. In other words, picture the king at this point. He's in the temple, and he's essentially at the altar. He's he's participating in the sacrifice with the priests. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Now he's speaking to them like he started as he was walking into the city. Now he's closing. He's saying, after everything I just told you, now you understand why I told you what I did at the beginning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. So this is the idea behind Psalm 118. And now you're in a proper position to understand why Israel, out of Psalm 113 to 118, which were the Psalms on their brains at this point, why they chose Psalm 118 and picked it up for this particular purpose of Jesus, whom they're referring to as king, is marching into the city on a colt. Not a war steed like they would have imagined. So he's beginning to confuse them because he's not on this huge stallion. He's on a colt. And they're kind of that's a, a bit thrown off likely. But still, they're going ahead with it. They're going ahead with it. And they're saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. In other words, Jesus, we expect from you what Psalm 118 celebrated about their king. In other words, Jesus, liberate us from Rome. Liberate us from the nations. Because Jesus, we feel like we're surrounded by bees. We're tired of Roman dominance. We want freedom. We want them to be burned up like dry thorns. Get it done, Jesus. And everything seems to be going well. Because where's Jesus headed? He's headed, if you read the Gospels, if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're demonstrating, where's He headed? He's headed to the temple. And they're saying, this is going just the way we thought. He's going to the temple. He's going to offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And He's going to start kicking some rear. This is what they're expecting. And Jesus goes according to plan. He goes to the temple. And as soon as he gets there, they're waiting for the sacrifice. And he grabs the tables and he flips them up. And he gets everybody out of the temple. And he starts yelling and screaming and getting after everyone in the temple. And they're saying, whoa, 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 whoa. What's wrong with you? And you begin to understand how in a period of a week they can go from saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel, to crucify him. Because he didn't bring the deliverance they wanted. They wanted freedom from Rome. They didn't want freedom from themselves. They didn't want that. They saw Rome as the bees encircling them. They did not see, they did not understand that they were actually the bees encircling Jesus. 
Jesus on Easter morning will be celebrating in His resurrection liberation from them. They were the bees. They were the ones that fought Him on the battlefield and killed Him and He had victory from them and Rome. This is the idea. This is the idea reflected in Isaiah 53. Let me just kind of go, just read through that and understand, I think Isaiah is catching this shock and awe of how it turned out and what they expected. He says, we esteemed Him, this is Him on the cross now, so it's fast forwarded, but he's saying, we esteemed Him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. In other words, they looked at Jesus and they thought, what's wrong with Him? But look at what Isaiah, look how he turns it. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With His stripes we are healed. Why? Because all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, this is the shock and the awe that happens when Jesus goes into the temple because they expect a celebratory sacrifice of thanksgiving for the victory that's coming, the victories that's happening. And instead, Jesus' actions in the temple communicate that they're the ones that need rescuing from themselves. That's what they didn't like. What do we see when He goes in the temple? What we see when He goes in the temple is His effectively saying to Israel, Israel, if I supported you in what you're doing in here, you would damn the world. If I continued in the line and the trajectory of what's taking place in this temple, I would make the world twice the sons of hell as you. You got it all wrong in here. Why would I perpetuate it? You've taken the outer court of the temple, which God specifically designated for the Gentiles, so that the whole world could worship me, and you've turned it into a den of thieves and robbers and lies. You've taken the portion of the church that Gentiles were able to worship in, and you filled it up with all your garbage. Why would I perpetuate what you're doing? This is to be a house of prayer for all the nations, and you're taking up their territory here. Psalm 118 is all about them having a voice, them having a place. And you've obscured that voice. You've muffled it. You've neutered their praise. Why would I perpetuate it? You see, Israel, I told you before, I want you to picture a, a pyramid of wine glasses. And as you begin filling the top glass, that top glass, according to the Old Testament, was the nation Israel. As God poured out His blessing on Israel, the glass was supposed to overflow because God was so gracious to them. Overflow, overflow, overflow. And as it overflowed, guess what? Before you know it, the whole pyramid is filled up. It's all satisfied through the conduit of the first cup. But that first cup hogged it all. Hogged it all. That's what's happened. And so, Israel is saying, celebrate our cause. Bring us victory. But Jesus doesn't want their definition of victory because it would mean damnability for the world. And so, Jesus is attracted to Psalm 118 too. He's also, he also loves this psalm. But he loves a particular portion of this psalm 
seemingly a little higher than the rest, at least for this point in his life. And the portion that Jesus loves, and the portion that Jesus quotes, he'll quote it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they'll record it, is Psalm 118, 22-23. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. But he's not talking about just the builders of Rome. He's talking about the house of Aaron. He's talking about the people of Israel. He's saying the builders are not just the surrounding nations. The builders are the leaders in Israel. Rome will reject me and so will Israel. But in their rejection, it is the Lord's doing and it will be marvelous in their eyes. Because through their rejection and my crucifixion, I will be resurrected and I will be, friends, Israel, Gentiles alike, I will become what? The cornerstone. I will become the cornerstone. What Israel failed to do, I will embody as the true Israel. Throughout Isaiah... Everyone's asking, who is this servant that Isaiah is talking about? Because sometimes it appears to be the nation of Israel. But as you get to Isaiah 53, you begin to understand that it is embodied in Jesus. He is the true Israel. And what he saw in Israel was something that didn't do what it was meant to do. That's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke will surround this temple cleansing with Jesus doing something very specific, and that is cursing a fig tree that's not bearing fruit. What's the significance? What's the symbolic significance of cursing that fig tree? He's cursing it because he's saying, fig tree, do you know who you're like? You're like the people of Israel. That their branches should be should be burdened, laboring under the huge clusters of fruit in the way that God's blessed them. And yet, I look at the branches and I see not a single piece of fruit. And I am a God that loves life. I want the nations to be able to go to this tree and eat from it continually. That's why the tree of life in Revelation will will bear fruit Every month of the year, not just one time of the year, every month of the year, and I believe it's 12 kinds of fruit that it'll bear. That's a good picture of God. He wants, the, he wants the globe to be satisfied in His blessing, but Israel stole it. And so the cursing of the fig tree represents Israel, a hardening put on them, and Him going through Himself alone. This is the idea. I just want you to, with this in mind, I want you to hear the verses from the New Testament. Listen to the way the New Testament authors write about Jesus. Acts 4, 11-12, Peter says, This is Jesus, the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's through Jesus alone. Listen to the way Paul writes, Christ came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. So in other words, Gentiles and Jews alike. For through Him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Listen, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into the holy temple in the Lord. In Him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You see, the fascinating thing is that Jesus doesn't offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving in the temple. But He will, in a week's time, 
offer a sacrifice. But this sacrifice is not a sacrifice of victory, victorious shout to God. This sacrifice is a burnt offering for sin. Not to perpetuate victory of a victory that should not be perpetuated. It is a sacrifice to pay for our mess. That's the point. And we know that it's a burnt offering because the remains of it were taken out of the camp to be extinguished and burned and done with. And just so the author of Hebrews will say, Jesus was crucified where? Outside of the city limits. Just like the sinful sacrifices were taken out there. In other words, Jesus was a filthy sacrifice. He was filthy because we're filthy. You're filthy. And I'm filthy. And that's what Jesus came for. You see, Israel's biggest problem was summarized in Psalm 50, 21. And that, to me, is one of the most sobering passages in the entirety of the Bible spoken of God. And it's in Psalm 50, 21, where he says to Israel, you acted, you spoke, and I remained silent. And he said, but now I will speak, and I will rebuke you to your face. And he says in the rebuke, you thought, I thought, God says, that I was one like yourself. In other words, all Israel went around and they viewed every decision they made as though God would surely have made the, right to, the same decision. In other words, they viewed the temper they lost at this person, the, the overindulgence over here that they did last week, the, the this, the lie, the steal, the thing, and every time, the gossip and all this stuff, every time they sinned, they said, well, God would have done the same thing. God agrees with me. God hates that guy too. God agrees with me, so why can't I talk about this person to another person? Because God wouldn't condone their actions, so he must agree with my gossip. That's how Israel walked around. And that's why when Jesus made it to the temple, they expected a sacrifice of thanksgiving and victory instead of tables getting flipped over. And when that started happening, there was only one option for them, and that was, this guy has to die so that I can keep going on my merry way. And so friends, I want this morning to be a sobering point for us because it was a sobering point for Israel. I want you to see that Jesus did not just die for those people. Jesus died for me. And I need Him now just as much as I needed Him then. You see, I have to tell you, going in the new members class, going through our understanding of hell, every time I visit hell, visit the idea of hell, the reality of hell, I'm blown away by the soberness of this life. To think of eternal conscious torment. And to think, what could be so bad to deserve something so awful and to justify it? That it's not, God, God is not an overreaching God. He's just. The scriptures are clear with that. He's a just God. So hell is not an overreach. It's not a, you overdid it that time, God. That's a little over. It's not. It's, it's perfectly just. And you have to ask, why is hell so bad? And the reason hell is so bad is because God is so good. 
It's a perfect reaction. It's a perfect equal reaction, equal and opposite reaction to the offense. And the offense is so bad because God is so good. Friends, when Jesus began flipping over tables, it shouldn't have been a baffling moment for Israel. If people were in their right mind, they would have said, I've wondered about that too. I've questioned myself in the temple as well. And I didn't understand that it was that bad, but now I see. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And friend, I have to ask you, is this how you understand yourself? Is this how you understand the sacrifice of Jesus? That it's, it's for a desperate sinner in need of Christ's sacrifice. And friends, when you begin to see the cross properly, you'll start to see yourself and other people properly. And, and it's, it's fascinating to me. We talked in our Connect group. Remember last week when Judah calls for Tamar? To be what? Burned. In other words, an over-exaggeration of the sins she committed, apparently. What we considered is that when King David was caught in adultery with Bathsheba, and Nathan gives him this parable of a guy that loses his only sheep, it was like his little baby, and he, the king came and took his, this guy came and took his sheep. Nathan says, what should we do? And David said, that man needs to die. You know what's fascinating? That was an overreach too. The man just stole a sheep, David. It's not capital punishment according to the law. What does that tell you? Judah overreacting with Tamar. David overreacting in this parable. It tells you that when you're off with God, everything's off. Your judgments are off. Everything is skewed. Everything's wrong. And so I'm begging you to understand that Jesus needed to die for you because you and I are screwed up. And we need Him just as much now as the day we repented. Amen? Let's not forget that. Let's not forget that. And we will begin treating, looking in the mirror right for the first time, and starting to treat other people and their sin properly, unlike Judah and David. Let's get it right. And the only way we can is for Jesus to be our cornerstone. Amen? Amen. Last musicians to come.